with a, with a heavily disabled child. Um, so what did we do? Um, I think sort of fairly naturally we, we sort of got on the internet um, and tried to find out what we could find out about it. And it was only then actually we found out he got hemi hemiplegia um, and we, when we came across HemiHelp. Uh, and we've been using it ever since and it's been, been very valuable to us. So I joined HemiHelp uh, about three years ago as a trustee. Um, we've been members since he was nine months old as, as parent members um, and felt I could give a contribution to it. Um, it's been challenging. Um, I'll give you a few, a few examples. From that initial diagnosis, actually, we, we come from Coventry initially and we had quite a good time, actually. They were, we had really brilliant British home teaching that you've heard about this morning and they were great with it. Um, we had really good physio, really regular physio. Uh, we had really good splinting. So Benjamin's just going to show you a few, a few of his splints from when he was younger. So if you want to grab, grab, grab your AFO, wave it in the air. There you go, there's his AFO from when he was little. He wore that to reception, um, he wore that to nursery, um, or many of them, as you know, because they keep growing and growing out of them. And when he got a little bit older, he switched over to his DAFO, which actually was a big step for him. It gave him a bit more mobility in his ankle, and he could certainly run around a lot more like some of the other kids. It's much smaller, much more flexible. Um, and actually, that really improved his social skills at school as well, because he was able to interact a little bit more. Um, we have lots of other splints from Coventry. We've got... Um, he had a sleeping splint that he used to sleep in at night, which these were very crude. The splints have come on a long way since we use these, but he used to sleep every night in that. We were always terrified he was going to smash himself in the head with it and come out with an injury. Um, and from that, he moved on to, to the plastic splints that he was wearing in the day, which you read one. Again, this was, the, this was the early days of splinting, but they used to make them in physio. The physios made them for him while he was there. They were moulded to his hand, and, uh, and actually they were quite successful. We had some quite good results with them. When he got a little bit older, we then progressed to neoprene splints with metal rods in them. We need to show them one bit. <laughs> uh, we had a number of those. The problem with those was they, they weren't bespoke. They were, they were off-the-shelf items. They did a purpose, they were good, um, but they were great. And then we had a real shock. We moved five miles down the road and switched to a different health authority. Um, my wife then rang up about three months after moving and said, can we come in and get measured for a new splint? And they said, sorry, we don't have any funding for paediatric splinting. You can't have a splint. And we'd gone from Coventry providing some great stuff like that to an authority that said, we're not doing anything for you. Um, we had physio, um, but that was it. That was as much as it said. So my wife um, really got on a mission. Um, she, she'd never really um, thought that hard for things, you know, she's, she's an intelligent person who's, who could argue a case, but it really, it was for Benjamin, she really needed to fight, and she got onto the local MP, she lobbied the NHS Trust, and after about six to eight months, uh, we got splinting um, paid for, for, for all of the children throughout Solid Hill. Um, but more than that, we actually got lycra splinting funded for them, which is fantastic. So, as you see, Benjamin's wearing a lycra splint now, and we've got a number of these that he's had through his life. Um, they were touched on by the physio this morning. Um, what we found with them, they've been great, but there's good ones and there's bad ones. We were really lucky that we had a good one, the first one we had, and it all comes down to the measure. They're made bespoke for them, uh, they measure every finger circumference, they measure everything, and they, they're, they're really good pieces of kit. But there's one of them's had to go back and be remade three times because the measure was wrong on it. So when they work, they're great, and, uh, and we endorse them, but we have to fight for them, and I think that's, that's a common um, theme that we see. Um, what can you expect? Um, well, Benjamin, we've worked really hard. Um, he cycles, we've probably cycled about three miles every weekend. Um, he did a full day rugby tournament at school yesterday. Um, we, what else do we do? We go canoeing. Um, so we've always worked on the principle there's nothing that he shouldn't be able to do. It usually takes a bit longer. Cycling took us about two years longer than his friends and a lot of back ache with me holding his bike all the time to help him. Um, but he loves it and it's great therapy for him. We found a great bike shop that adapts his bike for him. They changed all the shifters on it. They put toe clips on it for him and don't charge us any more money for doing it as well, which is even better. It's a lovely family shop. So there's some great people out there to help you if you can educate them and, and give them the information. So a little bit about HemiHelp. Um, HemiHelp as a charity is 20 years old. Um, it was founded by a group of parents, much like some of the people in the room today. Uh, and they were part of a research group in London. And at that point, 
which was pre-internet days, the level of information that was around was very minimal. So they came together to say, actually, what we need is a group of people who can share some of these common thoughts, experiences, and really be support to each other. And that's really where Hemihow grew from. Um, a number of our founders are still trustees of the charity, and their children are now sort of pushing up towards the thirties. Um, so it's it's quite interesting to see how they've gone. And certainly that's one way we see the charity actually growing in the future. We've already moved into services that move from childhood to sort of transition services to help our young adults move through into, into adulthood. Um, so we continue to do some really good work. But fundamentally it's there to, to share information. Um, we're a national charity. Um, the office is based in London, but we have people throughout the UK. I'm from the Midlands uh, and we've got visitors who I'll talk about who are in the north of England leading up into Scotland. What we try to do is spread our events um, around the UK. Um, we only have a limited budget, we'd love to put one on in every city but we can't. So we've had parents conferences in Newcastle, we're in Leeds now, we've got them in London. Um, so try and spread them around as much as we can. Um, we're a professional charity, we've got 12 staff, um, which is six and a half full-time equivalents who, who basically work doing the good work that we do. We have a number of um, projects and programmes that they work through with all the staff with different roles and a number of them are here today which you'll meet and I might make some of them put their arms up in a minute. So. Um, and we provide information. One really good thing that we reached last year is we, we suddenly um, managed to get the information standard for all our literature which I think was a really important step because it means it's externally vetted, um, it has a, a quality attached to it which people like physios and teachers can believe because it's, it's actually gone through that accreditation process, it's not a bunch of parents putting together some information. Um, and the other thing we do is really raise awareness. Um, if you have a child that's been diagnosed with hemiplegia, probably the first time you mention it to people they'll go, what's hemiplegia? I've never heard of it. Um, we had a week last week, which, last year, which was incredible where, where really it really got people talking about hemiplegia and understanding what it was. Um, so, I'm going to touch on a few of our services. Um, as I say, our biggest thing really is working around information. So, we have a number of information sheets, um, some of them more specific to different age groups, uh, ranging from what is hemiplegia, what do you do when your child's first been diagnosed, early years edu education, issues with brothers and sisters, and some of the emotional and behavioural difficulties. And I think actually, our experience we've had going through school and everything to date, actually some of those are the more difficult issues and the physical um, issues that we have. Um, because hemiplegia is quite a mild disability in many's eyes, the other things are forgotten. And in Benjamin's school, he's actually got a girl who's diplegic who's in a wheelchair. And the teacher's reaction to her is very different to Benjamin's because she's very visually disabled. You know, she goes around in a wheelchair. But it, it's subtle things, and we've had some great anecdotes from physios and, and people like that through the time. And when he was very young, we used to have really big tantrums, trying to get him up to dinner, to get him to do something, to put his shoes on. And we learnt after a while, actually, if we gave him warning of doing those things, of, of maybe five minutes, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, and we, that's what we do, we tell him five minutes before dinner and he'll come to the table in five minutes time and it'll be no problem at all. And it was his physio who pointed to it and said, well the reason is you have to remember that the physical issues he has actually impact on some of the, of the way he works and the way he thinks. It's not to do with any impact on his brain specifically, but when he, when he gets up out of a chair, you or I just stand up, it's what you do. He has to think about standing up, he has to think about coordinating his muscles and his balance. So there's a lot more preparation in some of the physical things that they do. Um, so actually, <coughs> that morning allows them to prepare mentally for them. And we do that with everything now, you know, when we're going on holiday or anything like that, he gets advance warning of it. And we've had to educate school as well. You know, school are really good at giving surprises for children. And we had one fantastic episode when he was in reception where they'd actually played out that an alien aircraft had landed in the school and they dug up the school playing fields with a digger and there was a crash site and the news came out and it was really, really exciting stuff. And they warned all the parents beforehand. And we thought, he's just going to freak out if he finds that. So um, we, we had to warn him in advance and he was very good. He never tells any of his friends any of these things, but all those sort of things really help with him. Um, one of the best pieces of information we've got is the primary school pack. I used it for the first time actually this year. Um, the one thing you'll find is every child with hemiplegia is different. You know, I can't tell you how your child's going to be. They'll probably be totally different to how my son was. 
But what this does is gives a lot of general information about the impacts of hemiplegia on a child. Um, the way we used it is we went through every page with a highlighter pen and a post-it note and said, actually, no, these bits don't apply to him, but these bits really do, and you really need to understand these. And I took it in and talked through the, his new teacher with it. Um, and school have been great. Um, we've had some, some really bad experiences with some of his earlier schools. We chose a very good offset rated school, which was a real, real mistake, because it was very highly populated. We had the choice of about four village schools, um, some which only have classes of about 15, 16, which in hindsight would have been far better school for him to go to. Um, the level of pastoral care at his first school was absolutely dreadful. The school he goes to now, they actually write the year's timetable around Benjamin because they know when he's tired, so they know when to give him the really hard academic lessons early in the morning and when the sporting activities are. Um, other little anecdotes that we've had, um, things like even his current school, who are very good, couldn't appreciate how tired he gets. And we were starting to get comments from teachers about behavioural issues, that he's being silly and messing about. And, and it's not him, he doesn't do that. He's, he's quite well behaved normally, aren't you? Yes. Um, um, and, and actually, it was always on specific afternoons, and it was when they'd done a lot of sport, and he was really exhausted. And, and we went into school, and we saw the PE teacher out of the head and said, look, you know, this is becoming a real issue. And the comment was, the more he does it, the more his stamina will build up, and he won't get as tired. And we said, OK. That's fine. I'm now going to ask you to run a marathon every day of your life. What will happen to you in the end? You'll fall over and collapse with exhaustion. And that's what he has to do. You know, he has to put a lot more effort into even standing up and vertical. You and I just stand there. His muscles are firing to keep him vertical all the time and help with his balance. Um, another good publication we've got, if you haven't read it, the Hemiplegia Handbook, um, was published last year. It was written by two people, Liz Barnes, who's one of our trustees, who's a parent and has lived through it. Um, her child's a lot older now, so she's got some very good experience. And Charlie Fairhurst, who's a, a leading consultant. Um, it's split into two sections, really. There's a very medical element of it that talks about hemiplegia and what it is and how it's formed and the different forms of it. Um, that's quite heavy going in some bits. But actually, the good bit I think about it, and I proofread the book, was the bit about how it affects your child. And there's quotes in there from parents on how hemiplegia's affected their children, things they've done things you can pick up. Um, we still overlook things with the hemiplegia. A couple of years ago, uh, he was getting told off a lot at school for, um, for colouring in the wrong colour. And he, when he was doing C's, he was colouring the C's in purple. And he got into trouble for it. And we suddenly thought, hang on, we ought to go and get his eyes tested. And he's actually red, green, colour blind as well, which is another thing. So, um, you know, it's, it's really important to look at these things. <coughs> So, touching on another one of our services, the helpline, um, it's not just a phone line, you can email as well. Uh, it's manned by qualified um, people who've been trained, most of them parents, who've had experience of hemiplegia, and it's really about that level of connection. If you're really struggling with something and you just need to pick up the phone and ask a question, you know, we've got an issue with school or we've got an issue with a physio or how they're developing or whatever, it's a friendly, friendly person to pick up the phone and talk to. Or equally, you can email through to us and, and get that help. Um, every person who sits on that phone line has training to make sure they're, they're giving the right information out. Um, family backup is another one of our services. This is, this is really the, the sort of step beyond the helpline. If, if people are really having trouble and struggling and need that sort of first-hand contact, we've got a group of home visitors, I say a group, there's two of them, one in the north and one in the south, um, who will go into a home if people really have problems talk through it, they're both parents, they've both been through it themselves, and know some of the issues you have, you know, some, of the, some of the things that can be quite upsetting and, and difficult to deal with, and sometimes, you know, there's um, tests talking this morning about sort of being strong for your child, quite often you start to question yourself, am I the one that's wrong, you know, is he struggling at school because we're not doing something right, but you learn to be harder and stronger, you know, we always minute everything, we always go in. And, and we go in quite firm fighting for his rights there to make sure he gets what he does. And the more um, schools and people you get who, who appreciate that, you know, the better they are. Um, we also will go as a paid service into schools to try and help the, help the staff and really educate them. Again, it will depend how um, receptive the schools are. Unfortunately, the good schools tend to be the ones that will ask them to come in, and it's the bad schools who don't. So it's, it's a difficult challenge for us to, to try and break that. Um, regional reach, I mean, the reason a lot of 
people are here today is because you share a common theme. You know, you've got a hemiplegic child, you want to learn about hemiplegia, you want to learn about therapies, and just sort of get together. We were actually, how old were you before you met another hemiplegic person? Probably about seven, weren't you? And actually, so he, he was on his own till that point, um, and actually it was a real revelation, and actually it was a right hemi mess and had to go and shake hands with them, which was an interesting one as well, because neither of them had got the rotation of the hand. So they both agreed after a while to shake left-handed, because it was much easier. Um, but, you know, that level of contact. Actually, when Benjamin was younger, he didn't want to meet, we, we always said it would be his choice, um, and he didn't want to meet another hemiplegic child. He was very much like his friends, you know, his friends see him no different to them at school. Uh, but actually, as he's got a bit older and, and a bit more interested in things, you, you have been a lot more interested, haven't you, in seeing him? Yeah. Um, he has also agreed he'll answer any questions at the end if you really want to. So regional reach is about trying to get groups together um, to, to, to share, in those, share in those things, to get group days to go out together, possibly even to fundraise together, which is even better, um, because it does cost us a lot of money to run the charity, so providing that support is, is very useful, and a lot of that support comes from our members. Um, and then some of the other media, um, this is a relatively new media which we're, we're still getting to grasp with, but things like Facebook and Twitter, um, I quite regularly tweet on there, Hemi Help are tweeting more regularly now as well, um, Facebook groups as well, the ability to talk on those, LinkedIn for the professional community, we had questions the other day on, on LinkedIn about a girl who was start, start, starting secondary school, um, you know, is, is there anything that anyone can share in, in helping with that transition? So all these sort of medias are there for people to use. The nice thing is with them, they're quick and they're accessible and they're instant. You know, email, you have to wait for a response. Those are, are really good. And of course the, the website as well, which is probably the biggest holder of all of our information, where the, the fact sheets are um, and, and where all, all the various um, uh, chat pages and things are on there. So a lot of advice can be found there as well. So that's really my presentation. Um, I've tried to leave some time. I don't know how I'm doing on time, Alice, but I've left plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I say all of our experiences are different. We've had plenty of it, good and bad. Um, certainly myself or Benjamin, quite happy to answer any questions you might have. Can you give us an idea how we started cycling? Because I know it's a problem with cycling, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. He's, I mean, he's a very keen cyclist now. Most weekends we probably cycle for about three miles. Um, it was hard work. Um, he, he started on a small um, small bike like this with stabilizers. Actually, he didn't get on with stabilizers at all. They, they were really bad. It, it didn't, the fact that when a stabilizer falls to one side, and I shouldn't be saying this with certain people in the room, but these were just standard Halfords off the shelf stabilizers. And we actually found in the end when he was little, it was better for us. We took the stabilizers off and I held him under the back of his saddle as he, as he pedaled. Um, he's always had a toe clip on his right hand side to keep his toe located in the pedal. And they do some small adult toe clips which you can bolt to the pedals, which were enough, certainly for him, to hold it in. When he first started cycling, he cycled very much toe dipping all the time. His, his toe was like that, to the point that actually if he was turning the corner, he'd scuff his foot on the floor when he turned around. Now he's getting much more proficient and much more relaxed. He, he cycles in a much more neutral position still with a toe clip. Um, and he's actually got gears on his bike now. And we, we, have to, we have to have all the shifters switched on it from a, a grip shift to a thumb shift. He can actually shift with his hands now. So it was a long process. It took probably two years longer than it would with a with an AB bodied child to learn. A lot of back pain for me, um, <laughs> and a lot of strength in your arm holding him under the saddle. But but he got he got there in the end and looks it to bits now, don't you? Handlebars he's never really had a particular problem with. Um, we 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 looked. We've had him cycling with his splint and without his splint. He tends to be a little bit better with his splint because of positioning. Um, but he's, he's always managed, what, what we found is he was always much stronger in his left side because of, of using that a lot more. So actually, you know, riding around like this was not a problem to him. <laughs> um, but, you know, he does need that hand a lot more now, certainly for gear shifting and things like that. So. I would just add to that that there is a very good um, information sheet about cycling, which you can find on the website. It's got lots of tips and ideas. So what do you do without the splint? What do you recommend? Take a splint off a cycle? I, I, think, I think with... Like with any child, you just need to experiment. Um, we, he, he didn't cycle particularly well with the split on, especially when he was in AFOs because they were coming quite close up behind his knee. Um, he could cycle with a DAFO on, um, but actually we tended just to put him in normal trainers and just limit the amount of time he was spending cycling. But it's, it's one of those, it's whatever suits your child, and I think you just have to try things and see how it works out.
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's all, it's all those little things. I've, I've spent my life kind of inventing things to help it. So he's, he's actually quite keen on playing hockey at school, and the, the teacher came to me and said um, he's having trouble maintaining his grip on his right hand on the hockey stick. Um, can we try strapping his hand to the hockey stick? Which he wasn't. Which, no, it's a great, yeah, great suggestion. And we, and we looked at all sorts. We said, well, we'll take it away with us, and we'll have a look and see what we think. And we tried all sorts of things. He got some strappings he'd had for his arm when he was younger with Velcro on and he tried those. He didn't like those. And it made him stand out from his friends. So in the end, we came up with, um, he wears a, a fingerless glove for cycling, um, which is really cool. So we, uh, we stitched one of the neoprene straps across the palm of it so he can actually hook his hand on the hockey stick. When he... So all these little things, you know, they can be really simple things that help, but um, they really make a difference. <laughs> Any other questions that anyone's got? I, uh, either for Simon or, or for Tess, or otherwise we can exercise the same workshops and then have a bit of time. Alice, what, what, one more thing, we're going to show the video. Oh, yes, yes. Um, what I'd like to end on today is um, we. One of our projects was actually, I will never know what it feels like to live with hemiplegia. I experienced it through my son, but he's really the one that knows about it. So we, we set up a project about 18 months ago where we decided we'd make a video. It was made by the children. They decided they'd make it. Some of you may have seen it already. Um, but it gives a real insight into hemiplegia and also how different um, hemiplegia can be for different people. So I'd just, just like to share that with you. is a neurological condition which means it's in the brain. Hemi is Greek for half and plegia is Greek for paralysed. Hemiplegia affects everyone in different ways. One in a thousand children born have hemiplegia. The condition affects movement, learning and physical ability and can make sufferers more likely to have other conditions with it, such as epilepsy and dyslexia. My name is Matthew and the meditation affects me on my right side, mostly on my hands. I can't walk properly without using a walking aid. It uh, might affect uh, water and the way I move and I can't really climb a lot, I can't stand very well. Causing me to fall over quite a lot of the time. I also have hand splints, but that does it. It helps me keep my arms straight. My wrist sort of bent the wrong way. Um, the, the way the bone grows. The emotional side of my alopecia, it's sort of worry and anxiousness. I think it's the worst um, thing that makes me sort of a given problem related to my alopecia. I get tired. Hello, my name is Emma. Hemi sometimes Because you don't have a splint or a limp or anything that's obviously <coughs> different, Mummy and I tend to think that your hemiplegia is hidden hemiplegia. For example, when people are talking, you sometimes don't understand what they mean. And this makes it very difficult for you to follow conversations. And sometimes you get a bit lost and you go and stand off by yourself or you don't understand the rules to games and sometimes you don't understand what the teacher is telling you but because it's something that's not seen it makes it sometimes difficult for other people to understand Hi, I'm Jack and I'm a TV in the room more of an afterthought as I try not to let it try not to dwell on it as much as it defines my own No what is it like for men around? I um, think uh, other parents are going to be really the answer and you know, sort of coming to me and you know, sort of really like this. Your child might not be able to do this and they will bring it to the other Well, in a way, it's, it's a bonus. I actually found sitting in the foot. The disability seems to be helpful. 
from my point of view, I always think disabled children are being touched by an angel, and they're special in some way. And when you look at children with kind of you can see that. The theme is going right through the disability. Your brain dead. It was really nasty to hear that people were saying nasty things about me, particularly behind my back. Um, and quite a lot of the time it was quite, you know, it was really sad and quite hard. I think when you're disabled and you're suffering from bullying as a disabled person, it gets hard to sort of relate to other people, you know, you can't sort of portray exactly how it feels to a person who isn't disabled and who hasn't been through that exact level of bullying. Uh, but my friends were very supportive and I think that they've been very valuable to me. The interesting thing that came out of that, some of those com um, comments in there, the children had total control over.